Frame Raider. I gotta admit, the history of this video is rather messy. Even today with my accomplishments, and failures regarding it, I'm still having difficulties putting a 5200 video together in a coherent way. The worst part is that it's hard to be sure if my issues are the result of a poorly designed console, or my bad luck. Nonetheless, I hope my journey will give you some insight to what you could be in for should you decide to invest in an Atari 5200. Without further ado, let's get on with this video. This is a 4 controller port launch Atari 5200 model, and this is... uh... And this is the second revision model which has just two ports. The 5200, meant to be a sequel to the popular Atari 2600, is much like Atari's existing 8-bit line of computers. They're often compared to the Atari 400 in particular, so try thinking of the 5200 as a consoleized 400 computer. When it comes to buying a 5200, which model do you think is better? The 4 port or the 2 port? Honestly, as far as my testing and research goes, there is no easy answer to that. Either stock units have their own set of circumstances. We'll be covering those throughout the video, so be sure to stay until the end. And I'm not saying that for extra watch time, this gets a bit complicated. Before jumping into the console itself, I figured I'd say a bit about the games. This is my current collection. There are a few more I wouldn't mind owning, but I've got all my favorites by now. You've no doubt noticed the labels I put on there. 5200 cartridges come with blank tops, unlike 2600 games. Pretty significant downgrade if you ask me. My solution's been to take a little masking tape, write a title on it with Sharpie, then glue it to the top. I know some people will think this looks horrible, but I choose practicality over searching for a specific game every time you want to play. An alternative to this, perhaps what Atari intended, would be to keep the games in their original boxes. Well, buying these games with their boxes is always going to cost you a bit, if not a lot more. But even then, this is no fail-safe solution. If you're serious about the 5200, you'll probably want to check out a few homebrew games, and a lot of those don't even have boxes. Collecting 5200 games is an interesting hobby because you'll either be paying a lot of money, or practically nothing. Go to a local retro game store and you'll probably find these being sold extra cheap because not many people bother with this console. So few bother with it, that you might not even find 5200 games there. On many occasions, my local shops would have a wall full of 2600 games and maybe 4 5200 games on a good day. Buying online is a different story. Some games will always be cheap, like Pac-Man. Others, usually Activision games, practically never sell at a reasonable price. Expect to pay more for these. Now, there's a market for bootleg reproduction 5200 games which you might want to check out. One of the rare and relatively expensive games is Montezuma's Revenge. You could pay a pretty penny for an original copy, or much less for this reproduction here. Ethically, this is questionable, but it's the Atari 5200 for goodness sake. Quick mention, I've never seen the Activision 5200 games being reproed before, so you're probably going to pay a lot for those regardless. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe Activision's still hostile about these old games for some reason? One thing you'll inevitably miss out on with reproductions are the controller overlays. Most 5200 games came with overlays that you could put inside the controller in order to know which buttons did what in-game. Once you've played the game a couple times, you already know what the buttons do, so this is more of a gimmick. I'm pretty sure Intellivision was the first to introduce this concept, but it didn't really take off. I'm not sure why Atari bothered with this. I mean, they didn't even make the effort of putting labels on their cartridges. You'd think that's far more important. Later into this video, we'll talk about controller alternatives. Most people would want to move past the original controller, and we'll get into that too. Just pointing out that other controllers won't make use of the overlays, so you can pretty much forget about them. Let's move on from the games now, to hooking up. To do so with an Atari 5200 4 port model, check out this visual demonstration. Now compare this to an Atari 5200 2 port model. A lot of people dislike the engineering Atari did for the first model of the 5200. Some have also considered it to be a fire hazard. I'm not the one to confirm nor dispute those accusations. I will say that there's an inconvenience to the original 4 port model's cables dangling around. This is especially bothersome if you intend to have multiple consoles hooked up to one TV. The worst part about the 4 port setup is how it is susceptible to more interference such as fuzzy visuals and audio. My 4 port occasionally suffers with this.
And it doesn't matter what you're playing, because when this occurs, you're gonna lose some focus on your game. Things already don't look too hot for the 4-port model, but that said, either stock units have circumstances. So what does the 4-port model do that the 2-port cannot do? Well, the obvious first thing would be the 4 controller ports as opposed to having 2. Unless you really need to play real sports tennis or Super Breakout, then don't worry, because none other than those two official games in the library used the full set of controllers. Who's gonna have four working 5200 controllers anyways? The second would be how a couple specific games will only work in a four-port model. These games are Mountain King, Pitfall 1, and k Razy Shootout. The reason the two-port cannot play these games is due to a difference in the console's BIOS. Interestingly enough, should you simply swap the BIOS from a four-port model into a two-port, you get that compatibility back. So that's one option, should you consider it. Alternatively, if you have an Atari Max flash cart, you can download hacked ROMs of these games that'll play fine on a 2-port. The third thing that the 4-port can do better, well, actually this one is subjective, I'm talking about exteriors here. The original 4-port model has a reflective surface, while the 2-port model has a sort of mosaic pattern on harder plastic. Another difference I notice is how on the bottom, the original 4-port has a piece that holds the RF cable. The 2-port model comes without it. Both models do not have a cartridge slot cover, and this is something that Atari never seemed to learn from, even the Atari Jaguar lets dust collect in there. Something to consider is that when buying a secondhand 5200, you may find it suffers from cosmetic damage, like a scratched surface or broken controller compartment. These two things are very common. This controller compartment in particular is more often found broken than working due to some cheap handles. I've owned a 4-port model for a long time now, and recently purchased this 2-port model off of eBay as a replacement. The 2-port isn't in the best cosmetic shape, and the controller compartment is broken. I've decided that I'm going to swap the faceplates and cover the two additional controller ports with electrical tape. Nobody really uses these anyways, and if you're not using original controllers, then it's basically wasted space. Wasted space that probably shouldn't exist in the first place because holy cow, is this a big console. Okay, okay, I know this, a Genesis Mini, hold on. Because holy cow, is this a big console. To excuse that space in a modern environment, I put the power supply into the controller compartment, then wrapped a portion of the RF cable around it. I then put some clear tape around the lid to keep it held shut. Now the console can be hooked up as easily as a 2600. Very convenient. As per replacing the bottom half of the case, this isn't possible without drilling a hole where the power supply goes in. I'm not gonna bother with that because the bottom half of this 2 port looks fine as it is. Now, we need to talk about the original 5200 controller. These are notorious for breaking down due to cheap circuit traces that easily get dirty over time and use. If you have one that doesn't work properly, in my case the fire buttons aren't functioning, there are golden rebuild kits that you can buy on eBay, which are infinitely more reliable. I plan to do this myself one day, but no time too soon. I wonder if I could still play Robotron or Space Dungeon with this in the second controller slot. I would try if I owned those games. Ironic as it is, I've never actually held an original 5200 controller until recently. I bought my 4-port 5200 two and a half years ago at a local shop without one. This 2-port I bought off eBay came with this semi-functional one, so now with a 5200 controller in my hands, what do I think of it? Well, holding the controller feels surprisingly nice. It's by all means the best of the second generation's unholy trinity. So long as the buttons are working, I feel that those are fine too, although the fire buttons on the left and right just feel squishy and without having the system on, it's hard to know if these buttons are even registering. The analog stick? You know, I expected this to be a great improvement over the 2600's joystick. Is it? Eh, sort of. Going back to an authentic 2600 controller is hard. The joysticks are very stiff and kinda unpleasant. The 5200's analog stick is a step above. I don't think you'd ever feel the uncomfort here that you do with a 2600 controller. One thing people often complain about with this stick is that it's not self-centering. Yeah, I can see the frustration there. Though for games the controller was actually designed for, you get adjusted to it over time. Wait a minute, games it was designed for? Shouldn't all of them be designed for it? Well, you see, a majority of 5200 games didn't use an analog-based control scheme. You remember the paddle controllers for the 2600? Have you ever tried emulating its games without one? They don't feel right because they were designed for that paddle sensitivity. Now, imagine if Atari made you use the paddle controller for every 2600 game. Sure, that would be impossible since it only moves in two directions, but it's a somewhat similar analogy that I would apply to the 5200 controller. The way it was designed proved ideal for only a limited selection of games. You're forced to use this setup for the majority that don't even benefit from it. At least on the 2600 you had a choice of what controller to use. In the 5200's case, playing a game that was clearly designed for a digital controller, like Pac-Man, is miserable. I'm unable to move the analog stick fast enough to reliably make those corners. Now, you may find this type of game is easy to play with a modern analog stick, 
like the PlayStation 2s for example. The thing is, you gotta consider that the 5200 is one of the earlier consoles to use analog control. It wasn't perfected like it is now. I'm guessing that the real problem here is the diameter of the stick. It seems to be too big. Knowing the 5200 controllers break down often, and that its method of control isn't preferable for a lot of its games, we may want to be considering alternatives. So what's out there? Back then, you could get a Competition Pro 5000 joystick. I've never used one of these before, but have tried a similar one for the Commodore 64. I'm not much of a fan. In addition, the controller's stick is not analog. Should you be looking out for one of these? I would suggest not. There are better alternatives, even if around its $60 price tag, this makes for the cheapest option available. Back in the day, the most common alternative for a 5200 controller was the Masterplay Atari 5200 interface. This adapter would have one 2600 controller into socket 1, with a proper 5200 controller in socket 2. Now you could play the 5200 games with a 2600 controller, so long as you had a 5200 controller lying around, for interacting with the in-game menus. Since this wouldn't completely eliminate the use of your existing controller, I think it's a bit useless. However, the reason I'm totally against it is the resale cost. You're probably thinking, well, a more modern alternative to this must exist, right? And you'd be correct. This is Retro Game Boy's 5200 adapter, which has its own built-in keypad. This allows you to use a 9-pin controller, like the 2600s, while eliminating the need of a 5200 controller to use in conjunction. It sells online for $60. At the time of writing this part of the script, it hasn't come in yet. I'm going to take a closer look at the end of this video once it's arrived. There's a reason I'm not mentioning it right now. There have been a few complications that I'll explain later. Retro Game Boys has one other option. This is their full arcade stick with an included keypad. Looks nice. It sells for $113. For a long time now, a website known as Cyberfreak has offered a converted Jaguar controller. The Atari Jaguar used a keypad similar to the 5200, with otherwise traditional controls on the upper half. In concept, this would be a great alternative, even if the controller overlays won't fit like they would in an original controller, though frankly I don't think many people even bothered with those. So how does this converted controller work in execution? Something you should consider is that the Atari Jaguar had two official controller variants that look almost identical. Most notably, the earlier model with grey buttons had a mushier D-pad, while the second, with black buttons, was rather stiff. I'm not sure if Cyberfreak always uses the second model controllers for the conversions, but the one I bought was. The stiffness of the D-pad is somewhat uncomfortable and makes playing certain games tougher. Because of this, you'll naturally want to put more pressure on it, which can cause a sore thumb after prolonged play. Another thing to consider is that these controllers won't work with about 5% of the console's official library. Seeing as how the original controller is analog, certain incompatibilities can be met when switching to a digital pad. Cyber Freak only mentions one game being entirely unplayable, which is Star Wars, the arcade game. Whatever makes up the rest of this mentioned 5% isn't listed, so if you purchase one of these, finding out which games don't work with it is up to trial and error. I do have one other example. There's a game I've wanted for a long time called Real Sports Baseball. Before caving in to buy a copy, I learned that this game wouldn't be played properly without the analog stick. The sensitivity matters for the bat swinging mechanic, so should you have a digital pad, I assume you'd be hitting the same shots each time you're up to bat this would effectively render that game as unplayable with a digital controller. The components used to make these converted controllers are already expensive since the Jaguar was not a very popular system. Still, that shouldn't change the fact that for a $100 price tag, this controller is not the easiest to recommend. There's one other 5200 controller alternative I've heard of, which I haven't used myself. This would be the new 5200 controller by Maker Matrix. This controller has a more modern form factor, it also has a keypad built into the controller, much like the Atari Jaguars. The big step up here is the inclusion of a real, self-centering analog stick, which the buyer can decide between being on the left or right side of the controller. It sells for $125. This sounds like every 5200 owner's dream. However, I fear a couple things which have kept me from buying one. Frankly, it just looks cheap to me. I'm vaguely familiar with the materials they've used to put its plastic casing together. This doesn't feel like it'd be a good material for something you're meant to grip onto. Then there's the back plastic cover which has no sort of indentation for your hands to fit into. I'm not sure why they didn't bother there since after all, they should still have the 3D model to play around with. In the realm of speculation, I wonder if the plastic they're using could break if there's not anything solid behind it, and maybe that's why they didn't go in that direction. I've been waiting to see if a second revision model comes out that improves on its design, but it looks like they're sticking to the original plan. If you've used one of these before, do let me know in the comments if my concerns are valid or exaggerated. Now that we've gone over the console and controllers, it's time to start playing some of those games. I'm not going to talk much about the games, I've already got a console library video for that. 
What's necessary is for me to document my discoveries between these two consoles while playing. So I played roughly 10 minutes of each game in my collection, coming across a couple strange occurrences between both consoles. On my 4-port model, using the digital Jaguar controller, the protagonist in Hero was unable to drop any dynamite, no matter how often or hard I pressed the button. He would also be flying constantly unless I manually moved him to the ground. On my 2-port model, none of these issues existed as the game ran flawlessly. 4-port again, I tried Centipede with the Jaguar controller. The turret kept slowly moving up. If experienced, you may suggest this problem has to do with the potentiometer, and we'll be getting to that in a moment. My original 5200 controller's fire buttons don't work, but for certain games like Centipede I can still at least move the turret around. Somehow, the original controller works just fine here, but the digital Jaguar controller does not. Even weirder, the digital Jaguar controller works just fine on my 2-port model. The last game my 4-port model wouldn't agree with with the Jaguar controller was a homebrew conversion of the Atari 800 release of Laser Gates. For only the first couple seconds of playing, the ship will forcefully fly backwards. Once you've messed around with the digital pad for a while, it sorts itself out. I wasn't able to replicate this weird fix with any of the other earlier mentioned games that had similar problems. On the 2-port model, this problem did not exist at all. One of my games had issues with the Jaguar controller on both models. This was Kix. I'm supposed to be able to move my cursor along the lines, but more often than not, the cursor would get stuck in a corner somewhere until I'd get caught up with and lose a life. Regardless of the controller being used, I found a small selection of games that have me veer off in random directions. This is not a problem because there's a very easy fix. You see, some 5200s may have had their potentiometer go off somewhat over the years, and this value is determined by a little yellow knob near the bottom right of the console's board. Feel free to put a game in and manually adjust the potentiometer while you're playing in order to get the most accurate result. Word of caution, don't play around with the other white knob there because that's responsible for the system's color. Now, here's a bit of an off-topic mention, but I'm trying to lighten up my load. I've got so much stuff and barely any of it gets used. My intention when buying this 2-port model was to make this video, then replace my 4-port model with this one. When I found the cosmetic condition to be poor, the decision was made to swap those faceplates. I did this, and there was no problem in doing so. To finally make space, I listed the 4-port 5200 on a local website for dirt cheap. It sold pretty fast. The only thing I can say is, the 5200 takes up so much dang space, and having two of them around... sucks? You only want one of these if you live in a small apartment flat? I didn't think that I'd have a problem, but I've now come to realize that until I hit publish on a video, I really shouldn't sell the equipment off. <laughs> Atari problems! That shit was hilarious. Why do I have 300,000 What the fuck? Why what is, is happening? <laughs> Why is this happening? Shit. Oh, yeah, man, what is going on with this system? That makes sense. Okay, yeah, I got yeah, one I key. So I need to... Oh, fucking hell, dude. What's going on? Oh, okay. That's, that's, yeah. Where is the last one? <laughs> oh, come on! What's especially weird about this is how some games like River Raid, Hero, and Laser Gates work just fine without issues. Then others would have blatant problems right away. Again, keep in mind these things never happen with the exact same cartridges on my 4 port. After a little research, I came up with a theory that you are free to try and dispute in the comments if I'm wrong. It seems like 4 port models are better at reading cartridges than the 2 port models. Of course, this relies on the problem I'm encountering being a card reading problem in the first place. Could this be a RAM issue? Maybe. I honestly don't know. What I do know is that other people have reported 2-port models not accepting carts when their 4-port model would play just fine. These reports are limited, but given the low popularity of the console, the plausibility of this reflecting an obscure truth is there. Now, I'm really not trying to sound like authority here, if that's not obvious already. I'm not educated in the things that could help me determine the source of this problem. You might be thinking, okay, just buy another 5200 then and figure out what the problem really was. Yeah, um, just to let you know, the budget of this video already reached about a thousand dollars. I'm not buying another one, and I'm definitely not scrapping this video. I do have a question for the experts, though. With whatever problem my 5200 has, is it possible that I'd be less likely to encounter crashing if I used an Atari Max flash cart? If that's my indefinite solution, I'll consider buying one, but I especially don't want to buy one now if this problem isn't going anywhere. Alright ladies and gentlemen, my Retro Game Boy's 5200 adapter has arrived. So here it is, and it's... something. Most of the buttons have fallen off. I guess I'll have to open this up then, won't I? 
Just need a 332 torque screwdriver. Please don't judge me for the tape, we ran out of hot glue. Anyways, the problem was the board holding it to the plastic, which got loose somehow. Hopefully this keeps it together. By this point I moved my older TV around, so forgive this less than ideal setup. The first game I tried was Pac-Man. Do you want to play 5200 Pac-Man with the Sega Genesis controller? Now you can. Do you want to play Hero with a 6 button Sega Genesis controller? Now you can. 5200 River Raid with the 2600 joystick? You betcha. It controls just like the original game. You ever thought of playing Mega Mania with paddle controllers? Well, now you can, but for some reason the fire buttons are used to move your ship. You might not be able to shoot and actually play the game, but you sure look cool doing it. I think. Now for the ultimate test. Is Kix playable? Oh my god, Kix is playable! Must admit it's strange to play 5200 games without a giant keypad in front of me, but this kind of strange is a great one. I had an absolute blast playing these games, which is a testament to how good they are. So long as you're not using a wonky controller. At the end of the day, it seems to me like the Atari 5200 is a waste of time. There's too much to get in the way of having a solid experience with this console. I really wanted to get into it, and if it weren't for my misfortunes, I probably would have. Now, just because I had these problems doesn't mean that you will. I'm only trying to show you that if this was a possible scenario for me, then it sure as hell was a possible scenario for anyone else as well. While I've had many Atari 2600s before that worked fine, and still do, might I mention, I've only owned two 5200s and they both had issues. I'm starting to feel like these things just weren't built properly. This is one of those old school consoles that is probably best left to emulation these days. Now, unfortunately, it's what I have to do to fully enjoy my physical library. Many people will suggest going the way of the Atari 8-bit computer. In truth, it is the superior choice through and through. The thing about that is, I grew up with the 2600 and always thought the idea of a successor called the 5200 was neat. Maybe if I had any interest in the 7800 I could go with that, but it's just not the same. The 5200 library has a lot of remastered 2600 games, and while that would have been a bummer in the 80s, today it's more appealing to me. If only the 7800 had a 5200 cartridge adapter of some sort, kind of like the 5200 had for the 2600, then the 7800 would be the ultimate classic Atari console, but instead it's something I'd rather not play around with. I've been desperate for news of the 5200 clone console for years. It's just not as popular as other systems, which is probably why none of these retro companies are willing to take that risk. But we've got tons of support already for consoles like the NES, Sega Genesis, etc. We keep seeing new stuff come out for those and barely any support is given to the consoles that actually need it. While flashback consoles are one thing, for the sake of collectors, we need a 5200 clone that plays those old cartridges. What would it take to get a 5200 equivalent of the Hyperkin Retron 77? It doesn't even have to be very good. It could be cheap junk, but as long as it plays those carts, it'd arguably be better than the real thing. Hmm, this is another one of my videos that just isn't gonna pay itself off, is it? I guess the title of Biggest Waste for My Channel can be taken away from the CDI and onto the 5200. Well, after all we've gone through, I can now say thank you for watching, and I hope to catch you frame raiders in the next video.